All right, let's dive into it. Most of us are possibly familiar with Scooby-Doo. Uh, Scooby-Doo is an American animated franchise created originally by two guys named Joe Ruby and Ken Spears. Ken Spears, helps if you say it right. In 1969, that makes Scooby-Doo round near 50 some plus years old. It's been around for a while uh, and and is kind of a monster in the animation industry from i mean who would disagree with that nine hopefully i haven't actually taken this poll but not, hopefully nine out of ten people when you walk down the street know who scooby-doo is that's because it's been around for uh, half a century and in that half a century all i personally really knew was that it was a cartoon and it was on saturday sometimes and then you know as i grew older i'm 33, 33 right now, as I grew older, I slowly watched it morph, but it was still the same kind of Scooby-Doo feel to it. I feel like that's common. Most people grew up with Scooby-Doo. Anyway, I digress. Uh, if you, if by some reason you don't know what the premise of this show was, you're the one out of 10 in the imaginary poll that I took. It's basically a gang of kids that solve mysteries uh, involving supernatural creatures through a series of antics and missteps. I don't know. It's, um, they're out kind of looking for trouble, but they're actually looking for somebody who's looking for some trouble. Uh, Scooby-Doo has aired almost nonstop in this last 50 years or so, uh, with a brief cancellation in, I believe, 1985-ish? Uh, due to some, I think it was, I can't remember what I read, something along the lines of, I, why would I even lie? Why would I even make it up? I can't remember. It just took a brief pause for a little bit, 1985. Uh, let's get into how the Scooby-Doo show came to be. Because as a child, I just look on the screen and you're like, oh, it's Scooby-Doo. I, I, I like this cartoon. But people, people make it. People animated it had to get on a very big network at the time, so you couldn't just do a little YouTube animation thing and then it gets in some algorithm and, and everybody likes it. It took, you had to move mountains to be able to get something on a network TV back in the day. Scooby-Doo, it's, we, we just see the ones that make it. There was a chance Scooby-Doo wasn't gonna make it. It could have been just an idea some guy had somewhere. Uh, and it was, it all is, oh, they all are, whatever, we're getting, we're digressing again. All right, so, back in 1968, uh, the Action for Children's Television was complaining about the amount of violence in animated cartoons. Uh, it's, we're still kind of dealing with violence and animations, like, people 50 years later are upset at Grand Theft Auto, which, I mean... <sighs> I know they're not direct comparisons, but there is some level of violence that you can act out, and they, the argument is, those who are against it, that these, uh, if you do these things, watch these things, pretend to do these things, you will eventually become that violent person. And while, once again, I have not done any studies on this personally myself, I do know that I grew up with some pretty violent animations and violent video games and i played them i was a huge i still play video games all the time it's not i'm not a violent person uh it didn't make me violent that's all i'm just that's what i'm trying to say okay so let's start again 1968 <laughs> the action for children's television uh act was uh complaining about how much violence was in animated cartoons uh specifically during Saturday morning cartoons. Uh, that's back when I watched the majority of my cartoons, Saturday morning. That's when, like, that was the prime time of the prime time. And it was, you know, they didn't like it. I don't know how much it was, how violent it was, because I'm not that, that old. Caught it a generation later, but, you know. Uh, it was, they took it to this dude. The, they took their idea. We don't want violence in Saturday, or we want less violence in Saturday morning cartoons. They took it to Fred Silverman, who was the executive producer for daytime programming at CPS. The big network uh, was looking for a show to revamp Saturday morning cartoons. 
So these guys have this idea. We're going to rewrite the script with a better cartoon that is less violent and is going to be awesome. Because, man, if you put out a non-awesome cartoon on Saturday morning, back in the old-timey times before streaming was around, how dare you? How dare you waste my time? Uh, during their trials to find the perfect show, story writers uh, Ruby, Joe Ruby and Ken Spears were tasked to solve this problem. They were like, you two are good, great, probably. Uh, fix, <laughs> fix this unfixable problem that we really haven't fixed 50 years later, but fix it. Do it, Joe. Do it, Ken. Uh, they created a show based on The Archie Show, which I'll be honest with you, I did not go back and look up. I did quite a bit of research, I suppose, for, for the Scooby-Doo episode that I wanted to do, but I did not go back and watch The Archie Show. I feel like that was too far. That's where I drew the line. Uh, it, I just want you to know that. Uh, and it was titled Mysteries 5. It features, uh, or it featured five teenagers and, well, five, I believe it was five kids and a dog. Sound familiar? Uh, and they were in a rock band and they would travel around and play rock shows. They're an actual rock star group back in, you know, based in the 60s. And <laughs> the dog was also in the band. It didn't, it wasn't just, you know, accompanying them. The dog played the bongos in the band. Uh, and when they weren't like out being rock stars, they were, uh, solving mysteries involving ghosts and zombies and these supernatural creatures. So they're rock stars and, and mystery solvers. All right. We got a cartoon. Uh, the dog's name in the show was too much and was originally written as a great Dane, but rewrote as a sheepdog started as a great Dane. Sounds familiar. Rewritten as a sheepdog. Doesn't sound familiar. Hmm foreshadowing uh they they feared we're gonna get right into the foreshadowing they feared that the sheepdog might be too similar uh to the comic strip uh, that was popular at the time so i don't, I don't even know if it's still popular I, maybe i maybe i didn't do the amount of research required but marmaduke they thought it looked like marmaduke and so they rejected the sheepdog idea and they made it a great dane once again all right so we've got five people traveling around this is the show idea so far uh, five people and a dog traveling around, solving mysteries. We're almost 100% to where we're trying to get Scooby-Doo. Uh, so this version of the show was pitched to Fred Silverman, the CEO of the big corporation, or big network CD, uh, the, uh, the, the network guy. They pitched it to Fred Silverman, and he didn't like the name, Mysteries 5. Because if I get it, if you're making a rock band, yo, dude, we're the Mysteries 5, that's cool. But a rock band name is a, not a animated show that can hit different. And I personally, I agree with Fred. I don't like Mysteries 5 is the name uh, for an animation show, cartoon. Nah, my opinion doesn't matter. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, he wanted, <laughs> Fred wanted to rename it, who's s -s -s scared, two S's. And I get it. Uh, first off, who who puts the stutter in the name? I get it. When you're scared, you might stutter. But who puts the stutter in the name? Fred took a bad name and made it worse, in my opinion. Uh, the CBS president, Fred Stanton. Oh, did I mess that up? God damn it. Hold on. Is he not? Who the fuck is this guy? Oh, he's an executive producer. I'm an idiot. Okay, so what I was confused, I thought this Frank Stanton and Fred Silverman were me just being a ridiculous human being like I tend to do and just write the complete wrong name thinking it's somebody else. Uh, but Fred Silverman, who we spoke about earlier, is a network executive. The president is Frank Stanton. These alliterated names are messing with my brain right now. Uh, the CBS president, Frank Stanton, felt that the artwork might be a bit too scary who's s -s -s scared for the young viewers and decided to pass on it. Uh, they were told to revise the show and tone it down a bit. They tried to focus more on its comedy than scary, which for Saturday morning cartoons, personally, I mean, I don't even like scary movies. Don't scare me. I mean, let me be in a little bit of suspense, but yeah, I think I agree with that. Let's get to the comedy. The, you watch Saturday morning cartoons for the funny ha-ha. Uh, 
Uh, the rock band element of Mysteries 5, who's so, so scared, was dropped, and more attention was focused on Shaggy and the dog named Too Much. There's just a bunch of bad names, in my, you know, completely worthless opinion, because uh, I'm nobody in this animation thing, and it's not 50 years ago, but uh, Too Much is not a good dog name. The Mysteries 5 it was kind of annoying, and who's so, so scared, still not hitting the home run. So the rock band element was dropped and more attention was focused on Shaggy and the dog too much. Uh, according to the writers, Silverman was inspired by Frank Sinatra's scat. Dooby dooby doo doo. I can't scat. <laughs> the end of his recording of Strangers uh, in the Night on a red eye flight to one of the development meetings and decided to rename Too Much as a dog named Scooby Doo. Scooby Doo and retitled the show, Scooby-Doo, Where Are You? That one hits right. That's a good one. I think everybody can agree. Nailed it. Thank you, Frank Sinatra. Uh, this version of the show, obviously, if you are familiar, if you were 9 out of the 10 in my fake study, uh, this version was approved. So, let's go into the voices, because once again, when a kid sees a an animation, they don't think, who voiced this? They go, oh, I like... Scooby-Doo. I like Paw Patrol or whatever, you know, whatever they're watching. Uh, we'll start with the voice of Fred. Uh, it was a voice actor named Frank Welker. And uh, Fred would, Fred described Fred, Frank, geez, it's all these F's. These F's are going to be my downfall. Uh, Frank describes Fred as the one in the group who has a driver's license. So that's kind of his role. And he does do quite a bit of the driving. Uh, and then he tells the gang to split up as well. He's a good guy. But uh, that's Fred in a nutshell, in my mind. Uh, Fred is, uh, he also describes, Frank describes Fred as the kind all-American uh, guy. Just like, you know, kind of jockey, but, but a good dude. Just a good dude. And he wears an ascot. He didn't, he, whatever. An ascot. I'm, I'm going to start wearing an ascot and bring it back. Uh, so uh, let's talk about how Frank got the part for Freddy. Uh, Frank was doing a stand-up routine, so at the time, I'm not sure if he was doing any voice acting specifically, uh, but he was a stand-up comedian, and he does this bit about this dog imitating a cat, or like, he imitates dogs and cats, and he does, he 100%, like, if you close your eyes, he does it so well, you're like, there's definitely, there's a 9 out of 10 chance that there is a dog and a cat and a quarrel in the next room. Uh, somebody saw him do that, and they come and asked him to audition for Scooby-Doo. So Frank was supposed to, who was, who Frank, who is Fred, we already know because I went over, uh, was asked to come audition for Scooby-Doo because of his dog and cat sounds. Follow me? Makes sense. Okay, uh, Frank originally wanted uh, to be the voice of Shaggy. And Casey Kasem wanted to be Fred. The corporations wanted uh, Casey to read for Shaggy instead of Fred. So they called him back three times and decided to have Casey, Casey Kasem, which we'll get into in a second here, voice Shanky and have Frank, the guy who does the dog stuff, cat and dog stuff, voice Fred. It's a little confusing, but hang in there with me. It all makes sense. Uh, the voice of Velma, Nicole Jaffe David. Uh, she noted that you would think that I would have went to Casey Kasem next, but I didn't. In my logical mind, I decided to hit, hit you with Velma next. Jesus. There's, there's going to be a, a better flow to this show, hopefully, in the future. Uh, Nicole Jaffe David, the voice of Velma, notes that she looked a lot like her character, and a lot of, I mean, not a lot, some, 9 out of 10 animations are, are uh, you, if you look at the voice actor, like, they base the voice, or they base the animation a little bit off of the voice actor a lot of the times, facial features, blah, 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 it's just, I think it kind of works a little bit better, because that person's actually that voice, so if the character which it gives them the artists a base to begin, but it also makes that voice coming out of that character a little bit more believable. Yeah, I'm just saying things that make sense. Cool. I'll shut up. Uh, so Velma also was supposed to be voiced with a lisp, and Nicole had a natural lisp. And thinking back at this, I don't even think I noticed that Velma had a lisp but when I, like, when I was doing my little bit of homework for this and uh, went back and looked, I was like, yeah, Velma does have a lisp. But when you think of professional voice actings, you're not just thinking them as ca of cartoons. 
you'd be like, oh, somebody with a lisp can be a voice actor. Well, here's an example how anybody can do this stuff. You don't have to be fancy. You don't have to have a perfect radio voice. Velma had a natural lisp and played one of the most iconic people. Velma. Like, just, I don't know. It's pretty impressive. Just if you want to get into voice acting, I'll tell you what I tell everybody and just try it out. You'll have fun. I love it. It's the best thing in the world. Anyways, Nicole notes that Velma was supposed to uh, set a good example for girls, that a girl doesn't have to be a follower. Uh, they could lead and come up with ideas. And she was. She was smart. Her downfall is her glasses came off pretty easy. Like, if you're out solving mysteries, if I was to go, from what I've learned in Scooby-Doo, that if I go solve a mystery, I get one of the straps that goes on the back of my glasses. Because if you lose your glasses uh, and you're in a uh, mysterious situation, it's going to, to, to complicate things a lot. Uh, and, but that's what she, she liked that Velma was a strong character that could lead and make ideas and was smart. Nicole really liked that. And I mean, th those are great attributes in a character. It, it must have been an honor to voice her. Uh, next up, we have the voice of Daphne voiced by Heather North Kenny. Danger prone Daphne was uh, a little clumsy and kind of a lot of the time would get the gang in a bit of trouble or complicate the situation a little bit. The original voice of Daphne had left the show at the time. And when I was watching the interviews and doing the reading, like I'm not even going to bring her up. I don't know what happened or what that lady did, but if she just left the show, but they wouldn't even use her name. <laughs> so I was like, okay, uh, we just, we're not going to talk about, we're just going to call her the original voice of Daphne, left the show and moved to New York to get married. Maybe they're just mad that she found love. I don't know. Uh, Nicole David, Velma, uh, was Heather's roommate at the time. So the voices of Velma and Daphne that we came to know were roommates. Uh, she told her one day, she's like, hey, uh, the voice of Daphne, left the show uh, how about you come i think your voice would be perfect for this come come to my auditions velma says and she does and she gets it and now <laughs> now they're roommates voicing one of the most iconic uh you know shows cartoons in in the history of cartoons anyway next the voice of scooby-doo don messick an older gentleman uh he, he did a, a fantastic job for the Scooby-Doo voice. Because, I mean, just... How would you voice a dog? If you asked me to voice a dog, I honestly... Like, off, off my cuff, I don't think I'll nail it. I won't come up with a Scooby-Doo voice who is so clearly a dog and so clearly not a dog at the same time a little bit more. It's just... Way to go, Don. Uh, he, he was in... He was a voice actor for Han, uh, Hanna-Barbara. Uh, their cartoons before... And he, he got the role of Scooby-Doo. He had some skills. Uh, he was the voice of, from the beginning of the show until the dude retired the whole time. He didn't <laughs> move to New York to get married. Uh, Don had an interview where he said that most kids didn't realize the people were the voices of the cartoons. And that's kind of why I talked about that earlier. Like, you don't really, when you're a child, you don't go like, hey, I wonder who the voice of that dog is. You're like, oh, Scooby-Doo sounds funny. Like, it becomes a thing in your brain. Uh, but he liked that. He liked that he was kind of mysterious. Because uh, when, like, when the kids got to meet Scooby-Doo or found out he could do the Scooby voice, they would just light up like a Christmas tree. And they, you know, they thought it was just the fucking coolest thing ever. Uh, and that's probably a cool thing to be able to do. Walk around and, and, and do the voice. And then somebody goes, oh my god, you know. I, I don't know. I'm just dreaming big here. Um, for a dog... Don gave the character a gigantic personality. It was like simple, but like Scooby definitely has his own personality. Unfortunately, uh, he passed away in 1997. Uh, so, you know, I'm sure everybody misses him. The voices, the voice, you know, I found out about him after too late after the fact, but it's cool to go, uh, to go watch some of his interviews and see he, it, they captured like this dude's aura. It's weird watching the videos. He's so Scooby Doo. It's perfect, and he, he obviously he's probably done it a, a million times. The voice a million times, and when he was doing it in the interviews I was watching, like he was 
super stoked to be Scooby Doo. So, uh, you know, they 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 found a good one. All right, Scooby Doo had a companion, Shaggy. Uh, <laughs> should have been the second one that I went over. Obviously, Casey Kasem voiced Shaggy. Uh, if you're like, hey, Casey Kasem kind of sounds familiar. Yeah, he was, uh, his prior role in the whole world and scheme of things was he was like that super smooth radio voice. I think he did like the top 40. Uh, he was a DJ, you know, on the radio with a super popular show. He's the voice of Shanky. Uh, they were talking to him, obviously, because I'm watching this interview and he said some along the lines of, uh, the first thing he auditioned for was a tobacco company, but he didn't really want to do that kind of thing. He didn't want to push tobacco. Uh, his second audition out of the, you know, radio stuff, because he already, he knows what it's like behind a mic. Maybe he'd be good at it. He's, he's trying to. His second audition was the character of Reggie on the Archies, that show I didn't watch from earlier. Uh, some dude who I didn't look up, John Irwin, got the part, and he was much better than he would have been. He thinks. You never know, dude. Don't sell yourself short. Uh, the third thing he auditioned for was Robin on The Batman, and he got that. So Casey Kasem is now the voice of Shaggy and Robin from, from Batman. Uh, right after that, he started to get a lot of other things. Yeah, Batman was pretty popular, my dude. Uh, at one time, he was doing eight to ten shows a year. So I think it worked. I think what he's saying is it worked out. I'm burping. That's annoying. All right, so... Uh, he also says that when he auditioned for Shanky, uh, they showed me a picture. So, or they showed him, not me. They showed him a picture and he knew that he was supposed to, you know, be a hippie so we can buy in the voices uh, of like the attitude of Dave Hull, who was a disc jockey, a DJ on the KRLA and the actor who played our Miss Brooks, Richard Crenna, whose actor spoke in a high squeaky voice and was always very breathy. I don't know what I just read, so if that didn't make sense to you, it didn't make sense to me either. Uh, so, but he got the idea of a breathy, uh, high voice, a hippie, and that's what he wanted to the voice to be. All right, so there was this guy auditioning with him, and he could do a really awesome hippie voice, and he thought that he was just right for it. So I don't know if Casey Kasem was just being super grateful and super nice, or if he truly meant it. Now I'm getting confused because I'm seeing consistencies. Uh, whatever. He the, the other guy was probably great. Maybe it was great. I wasn't there. Uh, anyways, Casey Kasem got the part, and uh, the show lasted on the network for 23 years. Or he was with them for 23 years. Uh, he gave... They gave him... They gave him the word Zoinks. Uh, but him saying things... Uh, oh my god. Let's try again. They gave him the word Zoinks and had him say things like all the time uh, because of the hippie aspect, but... Casey Kasem likes to take credit for coming up with that Scooble buddy o' mine old pal thing, uh, <laughs> which was cool. Nice, man. He brought it. Everybody brought it, brought it to come up with the uh, keywords. Uh, he also states that he's never used the word zoinks in his everyday conversation. <laughs> Weird. People don't just say zoinks all over. Uh, it's funny. He says it's funny that whenever he does interviews, they all want me to do the shaggy voice like they want him to do the shaggy voice. I can't really do it. Whatever. Uh, so, with the pup named Scooby-Doo, Casey Kasem, if you've seen that, it was like a secondary version of Scooby-Doo that they went, is uh, a pup named Scooby-Doo. Uh, he did the same voice, but they sped it up, so they did some mystery stuff. So it's Casey Kasem, but they, you know, they messed with the audio files a little bit. Uh, he said that they tried to find somebody else, uh, but just decided to have him do it in the end. Uh, also, bringing out another bummer, sadly, Casey Kasem passed away in 2014. So two of the show's legends are, are, are you know, doing the uh, character acting in the sky. Uh, so two more of them. Onward. We got, did I, okay, we got everybody. We got all five. We got all the people. We got Fred. We got Daphne. We got Velma. We got Shaggy. We got Dawn, a.k.a. Scooby-Doo. Okay, we did it. There was another side thing that I completely forgot about until I looked back, and then I instantly remembered, but it didn't have that same, uh, it didn't have that long-lasting memory on my heart, but, uh, it's uh, Blue Falcon and Dino Mutt, a.k.a. Dog Wonder. Uh, it's this dude who is a, it's a hero. He has that stereotypical superhero voice where he's very authoritative and all this. And they're, they're, he's a superhero. When you think of superhero, that's exactly, just imagine it. That's exactly what Blue Falcon is. And Dino Mutt's his sidekick. 
Uh, the voice of Blue Falcon was a gentleman named Gary o- Gary Owens. Uh, and he says, you know, looking at the storyboard when they were creating it, that you could clearly see how authoritative Blue, Blue Falcon was. So he just thought that the character should speak with great bravado and, you know, everything. Let's go. We are super excited to get there. Always up tempo. And uh, they basically the show's premise, a little sideshow, was Blue Falcon and Dino Mutt would use their wits to figure out how to stop crime and be the dynamic duo and all that stuff. Uh, of course, they had their personalities. Uh, Dino Mutt's a little bit more fumbly, and Blue Falcon is a superhero. Just, yeah, perfect. They, they both can't be two superheroes. That's too much superhero. They'd be way too good. They'd stop all the crime. Uh, Frank from before, also voiced Dino Mutt. So now Frank is voicing a dog. He's not voicing Scooby, he's voicing Fred, but now he's still voicing a dog because they wanted him, because he could voice a dog. It all makes perfect sense. Dino Mutt had a bunch of crazy sound effects. Uh, he would, like, extend his arms, and I'm not going to try to do the sound effects for you because my... it's I, I can't do a extend an arm... La- okay, let's try it. That's my arm extending super far. Dino Mutt I could do all these crazy things. He was like, like if you took Inspector Gadget and a and a, a dog and mixed them together a little bit, it's what Dino Mutt was. And uh, Frank voiced all of the all of Dino Mutt and all of the weird things that they would do, all the sound effects for it. If you have a second, stop this podcast and go check out uh, Frank's. He it's, he flows in and out of it so easy. I mean, the dude is, it's insane what he can do. It must be so fun to be able to just, you know, ma- have a creativity where you can make up sounds that fit the sound you're making or going for, trying to, whatever. Anyways, Frank uh, said Dynamo was a bit on the goofy side, so he really tried to bring a goofy or dorkiness to his voice. And he did. He had this, like, uh, uh, he was a superhero, but if you were down south in America... You'd be like, oh, bless it, bless his heart. He's a, you're, a, you're such a sweet dog. Well, hey guys, believe it or not, I have a whole second half of this, and I think I'm, I've been way too long winded. So I might break this up into two parts. If you guys are interested in the more up to date Scooby Doo instead of the OG Scooby Doo, uh, go down to the comments and just tell me, tell me you want part two, and I'll make a part two. I've got it there. Probably another thirty minutes of this stuff. Uh, but thank you for listening to this episode of the podcast. Uh, if you would like to support my podcast, I, I'll just, just go to patreon.com slash TVOSM links in description. Uh, you get my free audiobooks or my audiobooks for free. There we go. How about that? They're not free. My audiobooks aren't free, but they are to you. If you support me and my podcast on Patreon, it's a couple bucks a month. Uh, it would mean a lot. I've got three of you guys right now. You know who you are and thank you. You guys are my favorite human beings on the planet because you're supporting my dream, my voiceover dream, my podcasting dream, my my no- intellectual pursuit of knowledge in the voice acting realm, uh, like getting to do deep dives into Scooby Doo's and all of my favorite childhood cartoons that I was looking at differently when I watched them, but now now that I'm in voiceover, just it's it's like I'm pl- paying homage. Uh, thank you for listening to this episode. And I'll probably have another one out in a couple weeks. Fuck it. Good enough. Give it to him, Scoob. Give it. Give it to him. Give it. Give it to him, Scoob. Give it. Give it to him. Give it. Give it to him, Scoob. <laughs> Give it to him, Scoob. Give it to him, Scoob. Like we should have gotten rid of that crystal ball when we had the chance. (laughs) 